Good morning, friends. I'm Miss Melanie, and today's sermon is about what Jesus says about the storm. And before Pastor Russ comes to preach, I'm going to read the story from today's passage from the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's called The Captain of the Storm. The sun was going down. The air was warm and still. Let's go across the lake, Jesus said to his friends. Jesus had been helping people all day, and now he was tired. So they left the crowds at the shore and set out in a small fishing boat. Jesus climbed into the boat to take a nap. As soon as his head touched the pillow, he fell fast asleep. It was a beautiful evening. A gentle breeze rustled the sails. The friends were chatting happily as they headed out to the middle of the lake. Everything was perfect just right for a nice, quiet sail. They were only about halfway across when out of nowhere, whirling winds swept across the lake, fierce and strong, like a hurricane. A blinding flash of lightning lit up the sky. Thunder roared right overhead. The storm blew the water into towering waves that hurled the little boat up, 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 then sent it hurtling, crashing back down, down, down. The fishing boat was blown and buffeted and tossed and turned back and forth and up and down and left and right and round and round. And in the middle of the storm, Jesus was sleeping. Now Jesus' friends had been fishermen all their lives, but in all their years fishing on this lake, they had never once seen a storm like this one. No matter how hard they struggled with their ropes and sails, they couldn't control their boat. This storm was too big for them. But the storm wasn't too big for Jesus. Help, they screamed. Wake up, quick, Jesus. Jesus opened his eyes. Rescue us, save us, they shrieked. Don't you care? Of course Jesus cared. And this was the very reason he had come, to rescue them and to save them. Jesus stood up and spoke to the storm. Hush, he said. That's all. And the strangest thing happened. The wind and the waves recognized Jesus' voice. They had heard it before, of course. It was the same voice that had made them in the very beginning. They listened to Jesus, and they did what he said. Immediately, the wind stopped. The water calmed down. It glittered innocently in the moonlight and lapped quietly against the side of the boat as if nothing had happened. The little boat bobbed gently up and down. There was a deep stillness and a quiet all around. Then Jesus turned to his wind-torn friends. Why were you scared, he asked. Did you forget who I am? Did you believe your fears? Instead of me, Jesus' friends were quiet, as quiet as the wind and the waves. And into their hearts came a different kind of storm. What kind of man is this? They asked themselves anxiously. Even the wind and the waves obey him, they said, because they didn't understand. They didn't realize yet that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus' friends had been so afraid that they had only seen the big waves. They had forgotten that if Jesus was with them, then they had nothing to be afraid of, no matter how small their boat or how big the storm. Thank you, Melanie, for reading that for our families and kids. Kids, we miss you. Families, we miss you. We think about you and pray for you. Uh, it's fun to see you on social media and on Zoom calls when we have Zoom calls together. And uh, we're looking forward to gathering together soon. If you're at home and you are um, gathering, watching this, uh, we still always love seeing the pictures uh, with the hashtag CPC Nashville online. So um, if you 
keep, keep posting those. It's good. It's good for all of us. And if you haven't checked those out, uh, it's a good thing to do. You should check it out. Um, I'm going to get into this passage. I want to read the text uh, from the ESV of what Jesus says in the storm, and then, and then we'll unpack it together. This is Mark 4, 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there also were other boats with him. And a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Micah Edmondson, last week when he started his sermon, he said something that I just totally want to steal. Um, and that is this. He, he asked the question, are you ready? Are you ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ today. So are you ready? Because when, when I was working through this passage and unpacking it, one of the things that has been such a profound experience of interacting with this text is how unflinching the gospel is in this passage without promising us things that we might hear in a prosperity gospel. But it promises us the strength of Jesus. And so we're going to get into that. When we were putting this series together, The Constellation of Christ, the goal was to put together a series of messages that, that really focused on what Jesus has to say about realities that this season of pandemic have brought to the forefront of society. So things like worry, anxiety, uh, provision, money, suffering, death. And we knew that in this process, one of the things that we wanted to address was what is maybe perhaps the most universally shared question of this entire struggle, or at least experience, and that is, what does Jesus have to say about natural disaster? What does Jesus have to say about global catastrophe? And, and we're talking about catastrophes of nature in here, things like tornadoes and earthquakes and tsunamis and landslides and pestilence and famine and pandemic. There are also things like mechanical failures and accidents and architectural uh, failures as well, things where humanity plays a role. But, but what we really wanted to focus on is what does Jesus say about impersonal destructive forces that come upon us without warning, that have no motive, and they just wreak havoc. What does Jesus say about suffering from seemingly impersonal forces that have never considered us ever at all? Before we get into Jesus and the disciples in the storm of, on the Sea of Galilee, I wanted to take a quick diversion into a passage from Luke 13 because there's this very interesting two verses, uh, Luke 13 verses 4 and 5, in which Jesus mentions a tower collapse. He mentions a tower collapse in Siloam that killed 18 people. And I think it's fascinating because even here in the New Testament you see examples of impersonal catastrophes happening that people are just drawn to think about and know about. He, he mentions it, the context, is he mentions it while addressing the relationship between suffering and sin. And what he says is, those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were offenders, that they were worse offenders than all the others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So what Jesus was doing with that passage, the way he was using 
in this context, the, the collapse of the tower in Siloam is what he's, he's warning against something that people still do sometimes. And what he's warning against is saying that, listen, people who would say natural catastrophes are God's judgment against a specific set of people. If you're inclined to say that, don't. Uh, Jesus here with this tower collapse says, are, are you thinking that the reason that the tower fell and killed those 18 people is because that particular set of 18 people were worse than everybody else? But the thing that, the reason I really wanted to bring this up was because I wanted to note that when Jesus makes this reference to the tower collapse in Siloam, he's referencing something that was a big enough disaster that it was on everybody's mind everybody knew about it it was news it was something that everybody felt a connection to because it was a reminder of mortality so those who were listening to Jesus when he was talking they knew who those quote 18 on whom the tower fell and killed they knew who they were if not personally they at least knew the story why it's because when things like this happen we all feel the weight of it We do. We feel the weight of it. Events like this send a ripple through our affected community, reminding us how fragile life can be. Well, right now, the affected community is the entire world. And so we're all feeling the grief of a catastrophe of a pandemic. And there's no, you know, sadistic enemy twisting the ends of his mustache laughing at his sinister behavior it's an impersonal force but I take some comfort in reading that passage about the tower collapse in Siloam I take comfort in in being reminded that what we're experiencing now on a global scale is not new to humanity this has been part of our human experience since the beginning catastrophes happen and we feel the weight of it and so we're feeling it now So this passage with Jesus and his disciples on the boat, let's get into that. Our our reaction to catastrophe uh, can, can often be to become just paralyzed with fear. Something will happen to us and we'll say, I, I want to make sure that that never happens again. And so we'll take protective measures in our minds to make sure that we're preventing anything like that from ever happening. But the truth is, we just lack control over these things. You can't stop an earthquake from happening. You can't stop a tornado from ripping through our city. We can't stop this pandemic from spreading and making its way all around the world. And today's text is telling us of a moment that is paralyzing fear for Jesus' disciples. And the reason, and they have, in fact, very good reason to be afraid because there's this unstoppable, impersonal force that's bearing down on them And they couldn't control it, but they had very good reason to be afraid of it. And the reason that they had to be afraid of it was because they knew exactly what was happening. And so I want to get into the disciples' world here just a little bit. The Sea of Galilee sits in a valley. So you've heard of the Dead Sea. Just a quick geography lesson. You have the Sea of Galilee in the north, and then the Jordan River runs out of the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea sits 1,300 feet below sea level. The Jordan River, when you follow it north, goes to the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee sits 700 feet below sea level. Think about that. The the Dead Sea is the lowest point on the face of the earth, 1,300 feet below sea level. The, The Sea of Galilee is not that far behind it. So when you see pictures of the Sea of Galilee, it's actually 700 feet below the surface of the Mediterranean Sea just across the Jezreel Valley there. So it sits 700 feet below sea level, but then just to the north of it sits Mount Hermon, which rises to 9,200 feet above sea level. So if you're doing the math at home, that's about a 10,000 foot difference, almost two vertical miles. And what happens is the warm, low air from Galilee would crash into the cold air from the mountains, and it would create this wind tunnel that ran right over the Sea of Galilee causing sudden severe storms like the mountain was just throwing fastballs across the Sea of Galilee surface and these guys in the boat they were professional fishermen and the Sea of Galilee was their workplace they knew 
seafaring, and they knew this particular sea. And they were a tough, brave lot to do what they did. But they knew, they knew these storms that raced these 10,000 feet down from Hermon and slammed into their boats. They knew what these storms were like. Why does that matter? It matters because we learn a lot about the storm by the disciples' reaction to it. When they have the reaction that they did, we see that they didn't wonder if they were in trouble. They knew they were in trouble. They were in a 747 over the ocean with no engines. And they knew, they knew that they were about to die. We can be like this, right? We, we have fears where we have already imagined how life storms are going to destroy us. And no one can talk us out of that narrative that we have in our heads of how this is going to go. We have these fears. They're sacred fears, right? They're fears that we hold on to. And you, don't, you can't even talk to me about this or I will get offended. Do you know what yours are? You know what your sacred fears are? Those things that you're like, nope, this is the narrative that I have wrapped both of my arms around. I'm terrified of it. But if you try to talk me down, if you try to talk me out of it, I'm going to think that you, and I'm going to react as though you have your head in the sand and you are insensitive to my trouble. When I think about what we know about COVID-19 right now versus what we knew about it two months ago, when it was first labeled a pandemic, what I marvel at is I marvel at the hindsight and the knowledge that we have gained in such a short amount of time. And that leads me to wonder and imagine, what are we going to know a month from now that isn't clear to us yet, two months from now? Because it's such a fluid situation. And yet we can be so quick to resign ourselves to a fate that we simply can't know is ours with limited understanding, and we can chain ourselves to hopelessness as though, and this is the point I'm trying to make, we can chain ourselves to hopelessness as though the impersonal force is what ultimately holds all the power. We can chain ourselves to hopelessness because it's as though in our minds this impersonal force that is bearing down on us is what ultimately holds all the power. And this is precisely where the disciples are in the boat in this storm. Is they see the storm and they know it holds all the power. Now, we have a small view of what it means to live and what it means to perish. And it's not our fault really, that we have a small view. It's because we live in a narrow world of, of, of what we can see and perceive. So we have a narrow view of the world. We have a narrow view of our place in it. And we are filled with all kinds of blind spots. And even though scripture frames our lives in the context of eternity, right, world without end, we still evaluate our living and our suffering and our dying according to two basic broad categories, the storm and the calm. The things are okay and the things are not okay, right? A bill comes that you can't pay and you feel this, this weight of just feeling like you are ruined forever. Or a decision looms that you just are afraid to make because you're afraid if you make this decision it will eliminate all these other things and, and, and you, get, you just get stuck in, and paralyzed in, in indecision or you're in a relationship that you know it needs to end or it needs to change but you, you just don't want to be alone and so you don't do anything with it. If we're spiritual people we wonder in times like those, God where are you? Where are you and what are you doing? In these times when things are not okay and as we see in this passage a disciple is a person who follows Jesus. A, a disciple is somebody who will separate themselves from the crowds in order to be with Jesus, in order to follow him. And that means that you have to trust Jesus as you're with him. And the storm happens, Jesus is sleeping. He's sleeping in the stern of the boat. Why? <laughs> the theological answer, I believe, is because he was tired. Um, 
but he's sleeping in the stern of the boat, and his disciples wake him in the middle of this raging storm. I like to picture just a drenched, dripping disciple leaning over the face of Jesus with seawater just dripping onto Jesus' face. And he's screaming at him this question. And it's an ironic question. It's a poignant question. And the question that the disciple asks Jesus is, don't you care that we're dying? Don't you care that we're perishing here? And Jesus woke up and he said, quiet, be still. And the storm and the sea obeyed him so that it became like glass. Now, in those days, people revered the sea in particular as this utterly unmanageable force. To go to sea meant you could die at sea. You were at the mercy of this raw, unbridled power. Pagan gods of power were gods of the sea. And yet Jesus commands the sea. And notice that he doesn't invoke God the Father's name. He speaks on his own. He says to the sea, you be quiet. You be still. And the sea obeys him, speaking on his own authority. And then Jesus says to his disciples, why are you afraid? Where is your faith? And this is actually what set them reeling. Even more. Because how did they respond when Jesus calmed the sea? It's not that their fear went away. It's that they transferred their fear. They transferred their fear of the storm that they were certain was going to kill them. They transferred it to an even greater fear of the man who commanded it. Why did they transfer their fear? Why were they suddenly now afraid of Jesus? Tim Keller wrote this, and I'm actually going to quote Keller a couple of times because he has a great um, analysis of this passage. But here's what he says. He says, by his actions here, Jesus is demonstrating, I am not just someone who has power. I am the power itself. Anyone and anything in the whole universe that has any power has it on loan from me. The disciples were more terrified of the calm than the storm because it's as Hebrews 10.31 tells us, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Because look, it's one thing if the problems or unexpected changes in our lives come from something like a storm, which is blind, it's impersonal, it's unloving, it's an unknowing force of nature. But it is quite another thing if we come to discover that our trials and the changes that we go through are coming from and through an all-powerful, all-knowing, personal being who swears that he loves us with an everlasting love and is calling us to draw near to him. Why is this harder to process? Because this means that there is nothing random about our trials. There's nothing random about our suffering. And that flies in the face of the disciples' premise to their question because their premise to Jesus and their question is, if you love us, you wouldn't let these things happen to us. You ever feel that way? God, if you love me, you wouldn't let struggle come my way. You wouldn't let suffering happen in my life. When storms come to somebody who thinks that it's Jesus' job to stop them, Jesus is saying in this passage, your premise is wrong. I do allow people to go through storms all the time. You need not fear because those storms are not the power. I am the power. Now, I recognize 
that what I've just said, remember what Micah said, are you ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ today? I recognize that what I just said might make some of us mad at God. That makes me mad at God. It makes me mad at God that he would say, I hold all the power and I allow suffering in your life. Let me read from Tim Keller again. He says, look, if you have a God great enough and powerful enough to be mad at because he doesn't stop your suffering, you also have a God who's great enough and powerful enough to have reasons that you can't understand and you can't have it both ways. Little trick pastors do when they're preaching sometimes is they want to say something pointed and challenging. Sometimes they'll just quote somebody else saying that pointed and challenging thing and that's what I just did. If you believe in a God who is powerful enough and strong enough to be mad at because he doesn't stop your suffering, then you also have a great who's powerful enough and great enough to have reasons that you can't understand and you can't have it both ways. When an impersonal storm comes, safety comes by getting as far away from it as you can, right? When a tsunami is making its way toward shore, the thing you want to do is you want to get as far away from shore as possible. Because that storm, that tsunami, it doesn't know you exist. You've never crossed its mind. It has no mind. But for the Christian, when Jesus is the Lord of our storms, the objective is not to get away from the ultimate power. The objective is to draw near to the ultimate power, come what may. Why? Because Jesus knows me. He loves me. He has promised that he works all things together for our good. And it is under that banner of truth that he sends storms. He sends storms into our lives under the banner of his knowledge of us, his love for us, and his promise to work all things together for our good. Here's the hard part about this. We don't know what he plans to do. I don't know what God plans to do. I don't. And Jesus, here's the kicker, Jesus never promises to defend himself for the storms that he allows. God owes us no explanation. He lets things happen that we don't understand. And sometimes towers fall. And sometimes viruses spread. And sometimes storms bear down. And yet, the safest place in the world to be in those times is with him, is near him. Keller again, if Jesus is God, then he's got to be great enough to have some reasons to let you go through things that you can't understand. His power is unbounded, but so are his wisdom and love. Nature is indifferent to you. But Jesus is filled with untamable love for you. Let's wrap by looking at the disciples' question specifically. Don't you care that we're perishing here? Don't you care that this is happening? That this world is what it is? That these kinds of things happen? Don't you care that we're perishing here? We ask this in disaster because it can seem sometimes like he just doesn't. Because we think that we see the field, right? We think that we see things clearly and it sure looks to us like Jesus is missing something that's so plain to the rest of us. How, Jesus, how could you be so obtuse as to not see what is so plain to us? On what basis can we trust that he has concern for our perishing? Well, here's the basis. Here's the gospel. The disciples hadn't yet realized something that we now know. And what we know is that when they are in Jesus' face, dripping seawater onto him, pleading with him with this question, don't you care that we're perishing? What they're doing is they are waking the second person of the Trinity. 
They're waking the Son of God who had come in the flesh for the very purpose of laying down his life to deliver his people forever from our perishing and suffering. The fact that he was there at all speaks volumes about his concern for our perishing. See, his disciples and all humanity were in a much greater storm than the winds that tossed that boat on that sea that day. And Jesus came to deliver us from every breaking wave. Keller again. Jesus says, someday I'm going to calm all storms, still all waves. I'm going to destroy destruction, break brokenness, kill death. How can he do that? He can do it only because when he was on the cross, he was thrown into the ultimate storm. Under the ultimate waves, the waves of sin and death, Jesus was thrown into the only storm that can actually sink us. The storm of eternal justice, of what we owe for our wrongdoing. That storm wasn't calmed, not until it swept him away. See, on the cross, Jesus gives us a resolute, if not somewhat chilling answer to the question, don't you care that we're perishing? If he did not abandon you in that ultimate storm on the cross, do you think that he would abandon you in the midst of the storm that you're facing right now? He will not. He will not. Not only that, he has promised to return soon to still all storms, for all eternity. The fact that Jesus was even there in the boat with the disciples was evidence of his concern for our perishing and not just his his concern, but of his action to end it forever. Jesus loves you in your storm. He knows you in your storm. And he doesn't need you to understand all that there is to know in order for him to be faithful and good. You say, yeah, but if if I only understood, my faith would be stronger. Would it? Is it your faith that would be stronger? It isn't the strength of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith that saves you. Jesus. And that's good news, because he is the one who holds the power that we need. We don't. He is the one who saves us. And he is certainly powerful enough. And we see it here. Even the winds and the sea just obey him. They obey his voice. As Melanie read from the Jesus Storybook Bible, they recognized his voice because he's the one who spoke them into existence in the first place. He doesn't calm the storm with a counterstorm. He calms it by speaking to it with authority, as one who rules over it. We can't know when natural disasters or pandemics or catastrophes are going to come. They come. And when they come, which they will, we don't know what they will do. We don't know what this will do. But what we can be sure of, and this is the gospel, is the reason the first disciples were even able to ask Jesus if he cared about their perishing was because he had come to us in the flesh for the purpose of ending all suffering forever. And that has not changed and nothing can change that. And Christian, that is our ultimate fate. Our ultimate fate is not misery. Our ultimate fate is deliverance from all suffering and all catastrophe forever. That's where all this is ultimately going. Towers fall. Storms rage. Pandemics spread. But they never hold the ultimate power. That belongs to Christ. And he lives and reigns at the right hand of God forever interceding for you and for me. 
does Jesus concern, does Jesus care about our perishing? He has demonstrated through his incarnation, his life and his death and his resurrection, that not only does he care about it, but he has done something about it, something irreversible, and that he himself is the power. And for that, thanks be to God. Pray with me. Lord, I confess that sometimes when I come to scripture, what I'm wanting to find is assurance from you that specific things that I don't want to have happen in my life are things that you will stop from happening so that my life here will be easy. But you tell us in your word that in this world we will have trouble. You tell us that things like earthquakes and famines and wars and rumors of wars are a part of this era. And Lord, we feel it in our bones that it's wrong. And it is wrong. It's part of the brokenness of the world. And we feel it and we resonate with it. And, and we rise up and we cry out for it to end. Father, help us to see beyond the moment and to see the bigger reality, the eternal reality of your victory over all suffering and all death and all catastrophe and all of that ache and longing for things to be put right. Thank you for the promise that it is. Lord, help us to be gracious with one another as we're processing our own grief and our own sorrow in a season like this, a pandemic where we are um, separated from one another, where we're eager to be reunited, where we're fearful of being reunited. Give us grace for one another and an honesty of spirit before you to deal honestly with the things that cause us to fear. Help us to be people who truly do believe that you are the ultimate power. And though we can't predict what you will do, you do work all things together for the good of those who love you. Forgive us for having such a small perspective of what that even means. Father, thank you for your power displayed here for your disciples in that boat and for us. And we're grateful for your mercy and grace and care. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we prepare to hear the benediction and sing the doxology together, um, a couple of just quick things I want to mention that we usually mention. One is if this is your regular church family and you are so inclined to um, give, you can click the give button on the website there or on the live stream page and continue to do that as the ministries of the church continue. And as we're continuing to uh, keep our commitments to other ministries that we have been supporting as well. So um, if you, uh, if you, and again, use that hashtag CPC Nashville online to share your images uh, with us so we can see. And uh, we look forward to gathering again just as soon as we possibly can. If you're looking for ways to serve or you just want to be encouraged by, by ways that our church has been serving our community, uh, you, if you're on our email list, you get these emails uh, that give you updates, but you can also go to our church's website, uh, ChristPres.org, and you can see uh, places where we have, uh, you can see on our um, serve page, uh, ways that your uh, generosity to this church is making its way out into the city and ministries. One of the things we're doing that really excites me is our church is contributing to a fund that is helping support smaller churches with leaner budgets and 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 um, maybe not as much and not things not resources in reserve to help them continue and, and make it through uh, this season I love that we're in a position to be able to help uh, churches do that I've pastored churches like that and it's a great it's a great gift so um, all right if you're so inclined let's hear the benediction you can lift your hands and your hearts and then we'll sing the doxology together the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the matchless name and in the finished work and in the unsurpassing power of Jesus Christ. Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Amen. Have a great Sunday. See you soon. Love you, Cool Springs.